Good evening. Welcome to Bent. Tonight, Quedia, Steve interviews queer academic Dennis Altman. Good evening. You're on Bent TV. You're with Steve Pereira on Quedia. We explore all things queer and media, which generally means we explore everything. In 1971, the academic, the writer, the activist, Dennis Altman, published Homosexual Oppression and Liberation, his groundbreaking study of the gay liberation movement. It is an extraordinary book of the times, an essential guide, the first important analysis of what was becoming a global gay and lesbian movement. Since then, Dennis has written 11 books exploring sexuality, politics, and the interrelationship in Australia, the United States, and the global arena. His books include The Homosexualization of America, AIDS and the New Puritanism, Rehearsals for Change, Global Sex, a novel, The Comfort of Men, and Memoir, Defying Gravity. However, in 2013, as very celebrated 40 years later, Dennis published a follow-up or sequel to Homosexual Oppression and Liberation, the somewhat provocatively titled The End of the Homosexual. It isn't a statement, it's a question. And here to explore the book and the answers to the questions, we're extremely privileged to have with us Dennis Altman. Hi, Steve. Dennis, thank you. Now, I thought you reacted when I said sequel. I don't think I see it as a sequel. I think I, think I decided at some point I wanted to try and figure out what had, what had changed and what hadn't changed in four decades. Now, you could call that a sequel, um, but well, I actually thought of it as a new book. The, en the last chapter of Homosexual Oppression and, and is the end, of the, the end of the homosexual. With a question with mark, With a question yes. mark. And then you start off this book with that. Now, at the end of the first book, Homosexual op um, Oppression and Liberation, you had predicted or you had anticipated that there would be an end to the homosexual as a point of identity. But in the new book, you actually says, you actually posit that the, there is no end to, to the notion of that, of that identity question, and there will have to continue to be the kind of identity around sexual identification. In some ways, almost everything I wrote 40 years ago is wrong. Really? Um, but of course, how could it not be? You know, if we, if we went back 40 years and read what an economist or a political scientist said in conventional terms about what Australia was likely to be in 2014, they would also be wrong. Um, I think that what I'm really dealing with, and the reason the question mark is so important, is this ongoing tension between, on the one hand, saying our sexuality is the basis of a separate identity, and on the other hand, saying it's actually part of all human beings, and therefore, for many of us, it ceased to be a master identity. And I think that is true. And there are people in public life now, and the example I usually give is Penny Wong. Mm. A character like Penny Wong, someone who rose to the top of political, of a major political party, became a senior cabinet minister and was an open lesbian, was literally inconceivable 40 years ago. So in that sense, being homosexual is no longer the all-encompassing identity it was. But part of her, her hyphenated identity as an Asian Australian yep. lesbian politician, her being a lesbian is still very important to us in terms of role models and getting the media message out. Because elsewhere in the book you talk, you talk about the importance of media images in helping us articulate our identity. So it still is very important for us, for, for our Jason Bells and other public figures, to actually come out and declare their sexuality in a way. Yes, but I think we're reaching a point in Western societies, this is not true generally, where this is probably less and less true. Um, although, I mean, at the same time, and I, I do so, I write about this, every generation has to come out mm. and has to deal with the reality that they are probably going to live in a different way to the way in which their, their parents lived. But it is becoming easier, and as it becomes easier, um, certainly the way in which we think about, not you and I necessarily, mm -hmm. but the larger society thinks about being homosexual, clearly has changed enormously. I mean, when I first went on television 40 years ago, you know, when my first book mm -hmm. came out, it was a matter of saying things like, we're not ill, we're not deviant, and That's you right. should repeal the laws that make me a criminal. Now, not even the most conservative ministers in Tony Abbott's government think we should be criminalized. But in the global sphere, obviously, that's changed because in India has just recriminalized uh, homosexuality. Now, I understand yes. that's a le legalistic quandary rather than a political mindset. But certainly in Africa, there are 
it, there is the, the, the persecution of guests continues unabated. In, in oh, look, I think you're pointing to what I think is by far the biggest issue we should be thinking about. And it's a global polarization that's going on. And look, there was a wonderful example on my Facebook page yesterday, two unconnected postings, right? Mm -hmm. And the first one was about increasing persecution in the Ivory Coast. And when we talk about persecution, we mean people are being beaten up and possibly murdered. Mm. We're not talking just about name calling. That's right. right. Yeah. The next item was about some guy in Britain who'd been given an official award to honour his work for trying to um, prevent bullying of kids for being queer at school. And I think that shows very clearly that things are happening across the world in very, very different ways. We're in a very privileged part of the world, That's and I right. think we don't think enough about and recognise enough just how privileged we are. And that was going to cover with the question I was going to ask you later about this globalisation of the AIDS movement. And now you've, you make the point in your book where you talk about these young Filipino men you were talking to who articulated their identity in very Western terms because of the media they've been inducted. You know, and when Stonewall has now become a watershed moment anyway from Mumbai to Bogota, mm. and Judy Garland is celebrated in Timbuktu, that when the Kuntodian becomes that American presence, is this a form of US, of Western, again, has been a bit imperialism, or oh, is this another way of making connections and raising awareness about human rights across? Look, the I think it's both. And inevitably, major powers will have an impact across the world. And of course, mm. the irony is if we, if we take the United States, the United mm. States simultaneously is exporting the idea of what they like to call LGBTI identities and deep homophobia. Mm. So that some of the very nasty and scary homophobia in countries like Uganda and Nigeria is actually being supported uh, and funded to some extent by American evangelists. That's right. So mm. there is in a sense, yes, it is part of that. But I think that, that if we take that line too far, we're denying the reality that for many people in non-Western countries, they have made a conscious choice. They have decided that those identities are ones they want to adopt. And yes, often it's talked about, they take the symbols, but I don't think it's in this book, I think it's actually in Global Sex. I have a whole um, discussion of being in Tokyo and being in the little gay district in Tokyo and seeing these guys hanging around the streets um, looking exactly like American gay boys. Mm. You know, that was the period when everyone wore uh, caps with the, 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 the back to front right. look, right? Yeah. And, and sneakers and they yeah. had um, American football uh, t-shirts mm -hmm. and all the rest. But the meanings for them were quite different and the ways in which they thought about themselves were quite different. How were they different? Well, I don't think I'm actually totally capable of explaining because yeah. I don't speak Japanese. And I think that's what we often miss because we pick up the what's on the surface. And on the surface, it's easy to say, and there are people, um, there's a well-known uh, American scholar, Joseph Massoud, who's argued this. This is another form of you know, Western neo-colonialism. That's right. But actually, I know a lot of people in non-Western countries who have made, as I say, a very conscious choice to take on a lesbian or a gay or a trans identity and to merge those symbols that mm. come from predominantly, but not only Western countries, mm. because increasingly people are picking up symbols from places like Japan and Korea and Brazil and South Africa. They merge them to create something quite distinctive. Now, we did this in Australia. And if you think mm. about the history of Mardi Gras, which is, I think, a really good example of how this works. When Mardi Gras started, it was to commemorate Stonewall. It was in the middle of winter and only people who were deeply political were in the least bit interested because no sane person is going to march around the streets of Sydney in July. So not in a pair of hot pants, no. Exactly. Mm. So what happened is that somebody, I'm not quite sure who actually came up with the idea that in fact it should be an Australian festival and it should be at the time the Catholic calendar yep. has Mardi Gras, which from our point is very convenient because it's the end of the summer, at which point it became this massive street festival. So we had taken, yes, the American impact, mm. but we'd Australianized it. And I think that is what is going on, and I've seen that go on in places like the Philippines, in Morocco, in Brazil, you know, there's a long mm. list of places where you can see that happening. I'm Steve Pereira, you've been watching Quedia with Dr. Dennis Altman on Ben TV. See you next time. Hope you enjoyed that. See you after the break.
Welcome back. Tonight, Vox Pops from Carnival Day, Midsummer 2014. Tell us about the group you're here with today. Um, I'm from Youth Services at the um, City of Stonington, so um, yeah, just supporting the cause here today, giving out some information and um, having a good time. Matrix School is for lesbians over 40, by four and about, lesbians over 40, and we're about accommodation, support, uh, social events, that kind of thing. Especially uh, accommodation for lesbians um, over 60 in particular. Who, who need that uh, support. So we're Mentally Illness Fellowship. We're here mainly to create awareness for the organisation. And, you know, the, our slogan says it says one in five people have mental illness, but everybody can help. And uh, everybody's touched by mental illness. So it's about creating the awareness. We're with the Archie Lesbian, the Italian lesbian group. So um, we cater specifically for women of Italian Australian background. and. Um, yeah, so that's who we, we look at and, and try to support and, and encourage everyone else who enjoys the Italian Australian culture to come along and, and join us. Tell us about Enough is Enough. So the campaign is all about uh, raising the issues around stigma and discrimination and how it prevents people from getting tested, people from taking good treatment and being active participants in society. Uh, we're here with the Melbourne Queer Film Festival. Uh, Queer Film Festival is now in its 24th, 24th year. year. Uh, so it's one of the oldest queer film festivals in the world, showcasing all the best stuff from all around the world and providing an ongoing sense of community and showcasing gay, lesbian, trans, intersex lifestyles on screens. Fantastic. We've got, uh, we've got nearly 100 sessions, uh, films that cover everything from documentary, rom-coms, uh, uh, you know, trans films, short films, the whole works, the entire gamut. So it's for every film lover, huge amount of film. You Everyone can find something they want, and the films this year are going to be fantastic. Um, well, Bisexual Alliance Victoria um, is a, a, well, a not-for-profit organisation run by volunteers who support um, people within the bi community um, through activism, uh, support groups, um, where people can come and talk about issues and things. And even those who are bi-curious, um, not sure where they're at, even, yeah, everyone's welcome. As well as we have um, online forums um, to support that. This is um, Housing for the Age Action Group's first year here, but we hope to be here again. What city and country were you born in? I was born in Darwin, in Australia. I'm a little country place in, in, in Belgium, so from Belgium. Yeah, Geelong, Australia. I was born in East London, which technically makes me a Cockney, but I don't really sound like one. So, <laughs> so what and what group are you here with today? We're with um, Nichols Family Lawyers, so we're chatting to people about sort of issues that can impact upon them and the gay community. Well, I've recently rejoined the group called the um, Greek Australian Lesbian Group, um, and that's part of a wider Greek gay and lesbian group. And they're about encouraging, supporting, enabling people to live the life that they want, whether they choose to stay um, hidden from the world as being gay or whether they choose to celebrate being gay and Greek. You know, we, we um, try to cover all the different possibilities of being gay and being Greek and being lesbian. Tell us a bit about the Bernard Institute and what you do. Oh, well, we, we do a fair bit of research with HIV. Um, we're in many uh, countries around the world and uh, we do a lot of research out of Melbourne here. So uh, we're quite proud about what we do. Down on Commercial Road, down at Paran. Uh, we are the Miss Gay and Transsexual Australia beauty pageant. I'm actually Miss Transsexual Australia 2012. And here we have two of the Miss TS candidates and one of the Miss Gay candidates for this year. So we're going to be on the 1st of February at the Yarraville Club. And our aim is to promote acceptance and awareness for the transgender community. What group are you here with at Carnival today? Um, I'm with a research group. So we come to Carnival uh, regularly um, and just engage with the gay community about HIV and HIV prevention. Um, I'm here with the Rainbow Families Council. We're a volunteer organisation, community organisation that provides support for rainbow families and prospective rainbow families uh, throughout the state. We organise lots of social functions. We do some advocacy and uh, campaigning and we produce resources. We have a website and uh, we're a kind of very broad support network. 
And I'm with Prospective Lesbian Parents, so we're a support group, um, volunteer run. We uh, help uh, lesbian parents looking at a range of uh, parenting options and also during the transition from pregnancy into rainbow families. So. So yeah, we're just raising awareness about um, about you know sort of uh, HIV in, in particular in Victoria. Um, the key uh, the key message is about getting tested early um, and getting treatment early as well, um, because the statistics now show, contrary to sort of past belief, that you know we, if you can start treatment as early as possible, you stand a much better chance of reducing your viral load down, and that in turn then. Uh, helps to actually you know not not pass it on to uh, future partners and current partners uh, and that kind of thing and, and hopefully one day you never know you know if you know, if you can stop if you can stop the spread then one day you might even uh, eradicate the disease altogether so Headspace is a non-for-profit organisation and we work with 12 to 25 year olds um, and we do mental health support general health support um, and groups and activities and things like that so we're all about promoting good, positive mental health for young people. So um, the federal government saw that young people were, um, you know, experiencing a lot of mental health. That's when a lot of mental health problems start to, you know, surface. And so we want to get in there early, get young people talking about how they're feeling, talking, you know, thinking about the ways in which they think about the world and helping to find healthier and different ways that are going to, you know, support them to reach the goals that they want to, you know, get to in their lives. Manhunt, as you can see, we're at the Manhunt group here. It's a lot of fun. We've got some giveaways here, playing with the pool there with the kids. Also, going to bring out Twister later on, so a lot of fun. And being sun smart, we're giving out the sun cream to everybody who goes past. Uh, sea Shepherds and Marine Conservation Organisation. We were founded in 1977 by Captain Paul Watson to step up and defend our oceans from illegal poaching the world around. So we're most famous for our Antarctic whale defence campaign. We've got three ships in Antarctica at the moment, putting themselves between the Japanese whaling fleet and our, and our whales, Australia's whales, in the, in the uh, Southern Ocean Whale Sanctuary. So. Yeah, we take action all over the world, but that's our main campaign at the moment. Uh, Vic Bears, we, we're yeah, president big, uh, here. Yeah, nice, slim type uh, people. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the Bears is worldwide and uh, we've been around, this is our 18th year and it's our birthday, so we've finally become legal. And um, <laughs> it really is um, just a difference to the normal... It's about it's about being friendly, down to earth. It's not necessarily about a body type. So it's 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 about the sort of attitude, the friendliness, and sort of joining the fun. That's what it's about. So, diversity. <laughs> You're watching Bent TV. Any feedback that you would like to send us? Feedback at benttv.org.au. Back shortly. Welcome back, this is Bent TV. Next, we have Malice interviewing author Sarah Corner. Welcome to Dig Deeper with me, Malice. And tonight I'm joined by a very special guest who is coming to talk about her new children's book that she's created. Welcome, Sarah Corner. Thank Thanks you. for joining us. So uh, your book has been described as Australia's first children's book to address polyamory. That's right. Being a children's book, this might be considered a hard topic to address. Uh, can you explain briefly what polyamory is? Polyamory is engaging in relationships with more than one person mm. um, that's consensual. So everybody um, in the relationship knows that um, you know, they're in relationship with another person. Mm, so okay. it's basically um, non-monogamy, so mm. ethical non-monogamy. Okay, so um, you're saying, yes, so everybody knows. So that's probably the difference between, say, cheating? Yes. Really? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, this, okay. is, this, is a, this is a relationship where um, each adult in the relationship is able to um, have other relationships mm. and um, there's not... It's not just one partner that's allowed to, yeah. but it's an okay. open... Yeah, okay, thing. so it, that would probably be, uh, people would recognise the term open relationship, is that a sort yeah. of to, to yeah. do with polyamory? Okay, it's interesting. For your book, you uh, have done a crowdfunding campaign. Yes. What sort of response did you receive? A really, really great response, actually. Awesome. Uh, we got um, $1,500 more than we asked oh, for. Very cool. So we had a lot of really great support from all over. Um, yeah. Got a lot of support in Australia and within Melbourne, mm. but also um, 
from the US and Germany oh, as really? well. So, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, oh, interesting actually that you mentioned Germany as a tangent. I just saw today that Germany's the first place in the world to now say that you don't have to tick male or female on the birth certificate of your child. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, <laughs> awesome. So Germany's ahead of the uh, world on a lot of things, I think. Um, so the book is called Raph and the Robots. Yes. Can you tell me about the family portrayed and what makes them different to other families and children's books? Sure. Um, the family in this book is a three adult family. So there okay. are three adults and three kids in the family. Um, so, you know, rather than a, your traditional story, we'll often have just mother, father, or yeah. thankfully there's a lot more books now that have two mums and two dads as yeah. well. Yeah. But this, yeah, this family is um, a family of um, two women and, and a male mm. adult. Okay. And it's, it's done in a very subtle way. It's also, um, I wanted it to be able to be viewed by lots of different children and families mm. and hope for them to see their own families in it. So okay. I haven't actually given the, the adult characters any names mm. in the story and uh, to avoid saying mum and dad and ah. to allow more people to see their own families reflected in it. Well, that's a really good idea, yeah. Um, so what's the story about? The story is about a young boy called Raph. Yes. Who really wants to have his story read by his someone in his family. Okay. So he's written this fantastic story. He's really proud of it. And he's going through one by one um, his family members trying to get them to read his story. Mm. Um, unfortunately, they're very, very busy. Oh, the I chaos of family this. life. Yes. Which is um, something yep. I'm very familiar Indeed, with. Indeed, me too. <laughs> and, yep. uh, and they're very busy at the time. He has a bit of an emotional breakdown. Yep. And then the family comes and... Um, comes together at the, at the end to okay, cool. to help him to share his story. So what you're saying is kind of like a subtle thing. You haven't actually done any kind of hammering home about polyamory. It's just <laughs> representing a polyamory kind of family, yeah? Yeah, it's a, it could be a polyamorous family mm. or it could also be um, a family queer with family. a queer family mm. or a family with um, a donor father or... Yeah, um, yeah, cool. It could be any number of types yeah. of families but okay. um, the main aim was though to represent a family um, a polyamorous family because mm. there's really nothing out there yeah okay yeah. interesting yeah because as you say there is starting to be books with queer parents portrayed but yeah okay this is the first excellent yeah. Is Raph and the Robots for kids predominantly in poly families or is it for the wider community at large I'd say it's for the wider community um, I really did want to have a book that um, could represent polyamorous families because it's mm. lacking so much. But um, I, I did deliberately make choices about the book, like not having the names of the mm. adults in the yeah. book, in order to make it more accessible to a range of different people within the, okay. the community and mm. the queer community. Yeah, cool. Um, so yeah, we have come a long way because I remember not so long ago there being complaints uh, leveled at play school for showing a lesbian <laughs> couple with yeah. a child. Um, have you had any negative sort of comments so far? Surprisingly, no. Wow, that's cool. I, I was nervous about that actually, but mm. we've had such an amazing amount of support from oh, from the community and yeah. uh, we, we really haven't come across anything negative at all. Yeah. A lot of people are just really saying, thank you for writing this book. We've yeah. been looking for something like this yeah. for a long time. A lot of families who just aren't represented in children's books. Mm, okay. so it seems that um, authors tend to stay, play safe a bit with mm. um, the books that they write yep. and keep with a traditional yep. family. Um, so, yeah, there's definitely a market for it. Yeah, okay, yeah, because I guess maybe it's safer, do you think, for people to not, not go out of the uh, a kind of average... Yeah, well, maybe they think that it's uh, there's not enough people out there who might like to buy their book. Yes, yeah, it's <laughs> about it's the dollar, about of course it is. But yeah. the, the truth is really, though, that so many families now, um, even in traditional families, yeah. are um, looking for books to show diversity and to yeah. teach their children about about how the world really is. <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. I think and we're having, having got two children. Yes, I'd like to be able to show them uh, things that kind of represent my friends as well, right? What do your children think about it? Um, they're pretty excited about it. Yeah. Um, the characters do resemble them somewhat. Yes, I've noticed um, <laughs> Yes. So, um, well, the, one of the main reasons, uh, one of the main drivers for me to write the book was because I wanted a book to show... Yeah, awesome. um, ..to show my daughter. Yeah, um, yeah She's cool. two years old, so we're... Um, this, this I wanted what family's like. Yeah, yeah, a book for her to see her family represented. Excellent. So, Sarah, just finally, how can people find the book? 
Um, you can go to uh, my website, yes. www.possible.com forward slash stories for unique families. Awesome. And we also have a Facebook page. Cool. And um, yeah, it's, you can pre-order books online oh, and um, we've got a Facebook page that's updated regularly with lots of... Excellent stuff about Details. what's going on. Cool. All right, yes. we cannot wait to see this book. It's <laughs> very exciting. Thank you very much for joining us, Sarah Corner. Thank you very much for having me. See you next time on Dig Deeper. That's our show for tonight. Thank you for watching. If you would like to support us, uh, find out how you can help, join us, help produce programs, please visit www.bintv.org.au. You can always like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. Thank you. Till next week. Good night.